It's April 4th, 2009. In the dusty morning heat of the San Fernando Magistrates Court in southern Trinidad, six Colombian women are fined 5,000 Trinidad dollars, or one year imprisonment each, for entering the country illegally in search of a better life. None of them is over 26 years old. They were smuggled into the country by boat in the dead of night to work in the sex trade. Similar stories appear on April 30th, one in June, one in October, one in December, December 4th, actually. These are all young women escaping a country characterized by civil conflict, extreme poverty, and the drug trade in order to support elderly parents and children, pay for medical care, and save for a home. This is how underdevelopment, Poverty, debt, poor governance, political conflict, and sexual exploitation all combine to more greatly affect girls and women in the Caribbean region. These six young women have felt the effects of patriarchy, a world where females and femininity command lower and more limited status and resources. Human trafficking is the third most lucrative economic activity in the world, after drugs and guns. This is how it is gendered. Globally, our notions of masculinity and femininity give women less power, fewer rights, and greater vulnerabilities. There is still need for a feminist revolution to transform these realities. Until there is not a single poor woman in the world, we have not yet won. It's January 23rd, 2010. An 18-year-old boy is shot at 2.20 in the afternoon. He makes number 31 of those murdered for the year, mostly men and boys. He's standing on a corner when two men walk up to him, fire sh several shots, and kill him. This is how men suffer under patriarchy. Manhood is about a struggle for control, status, power, and resources amongst boys and men. And often, violence is legitimized as natural, as a form of self-expression, and as a means of dealing with conflict. Patriarchy benefits men, yet it also harms them, forcing them to avoid activities, spheres, jobs, and roles associated with nurturing, passivity, vulnerability, and femininity. It socializes them to value and respect violence, including sexual violence, to seek to live up to ideals of the male breadwinner and provider, which may be unattainable through participation in the legal labor market. But patriarchal ideals compel males to reject schooling as feminized, to take risks with their sexuality and health, fear homophobic labels, whether or not they are gay or straight, and to reject solidarities with working class women's struggles against the very political and economic structures that downpress them too. But there's no hard divide between the Babylon they fight and women's taking back the night. Collective liberation has to be our goal, the passion of our soul, that thing that we do. I'm in downtown Kingston, Jamaica, in Tivoli Gardens at about 3.30 a.m. in the morning, in the middle of a Pasa Pasa dance or block party in the street. Next to the groups of young men and women bursting out with spontaneous and choreographed stylies, there's a young black man working at a wooden bar selling ganja. He's cleaning these large buds while he softly tries some sweet talk on me. So, you from Trini? Yeah. You came to have some fun? Nah, I came to a conference I teach at the university. Yeah, what you teach? I teach feminist theory. At this point, he does a double take, looks in my eyes. <laughs> Saying this often provokes a startle reaction. Feminist theory? Like I either made it up on the spot or suddenly came down with an illness. And comments such as, so you hate men, or so you teach sexism, or even, so I should be afraid of talking to you then, are familiar responses. Not everyone says this, though. Sometimes both men and women ask, what does that mean, or what's that about? Or even, so what is feminism? That's how I got started talking to this inquisitive 20-year-old at one of the darkest hours before dawn in a concrete jungle. On my way to work, I stop along a rural road lined with cocoa trees to give a young woman and her little daughter a lift one morning. 
She also says, explain what that is. Instead of starting with a description of feminism, I ask her if she thinks there are any differences between her experiences as a woman and those of men. She says, no. I ask her if she has a partner and who does most of the housework. She says that though both of them work, she does most of the housework. She doesn't know why it's so, if that's just how we're taught, if men are saying, well, if women want to work, let them work, but they still have their work at home to do. But she finds it's not fair. Don't you want a world where wife and husband equally share housework, where things are more fair, I ask? Yes, she says excitedly, of course, getting out of the car to take her child to school. We have to talk more about this. I like this. And on the way out, handed me a biblical pamphlet that she wanted to share in return. At a wedding in the hills of Trinidad, a friend's husband tells me that I seem too friendly to be feminist. We talk. Now his young daughter wouldn't be forcibly retired from the public service upon marriage, has laws protecting her against domestic violence, would be equal to her husband, would have the right not to be discriminated against in her workplace, and could make a living wage. He was glad for those gains and knew that there was still more to secure. Safety, no fear on the streets or at night, no one advantaging her. Well, you want things feminists want, I said. I never thought of myself before as a feminist, he joked. His wife looked at me and chuckled. This is feminist movement building, raising consciousness, making allies, showing how stereotypes cause misunderstanding, division, and fear, how they falsely pit us against each other and hide our responsibilities to each other, silence us from articulating our rights even to ourselves. This is making a revolution a way of life. A majority of both women and men lose from how the world is organized, but women are hit hardest because of their sex. That's why the heart of this movement is mobilizing girls and women to individually and collectively take action to transform gender injustice. Yet feminist struggles seek a better world for boys and men too, a world less violent, a world where a worker could buy even a small home, a world safer for your child and sister, a world where there are fewer guns, less killing, where people are equal, where we take better care of the earth and better care of one another, where we can be who we are, excel in school, make informed choices, and get respect. And this is what you want, I asked my young brethren in Tivoli. He nodded. Well, women and men are not much different. We both want to be loved, listened to, treated like a human being, helped. I need you on the front line next to me too. This is why feminism is for everybody. Under the boom of the speakers, he thoughtfully whispered, true. I speak to you today from Trinidad and Tobago, a small English-speaking twin island republic in the Latin American and Caribbean region. But the realities here are not isolated ones. When a secondary school boy shouts to a schoolgirl across the road, Hey Gil, come over here, let me make a porn movie now. He's only one point of impact in a global circulation of sexuality that includes New Europe, New York, Miami, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, and Guyana. Both he and the schoolgirl have seen almost two decades of U.S. hip-hop videos glorify pimping and culturally export gender relations defined by ideals of young hoes, bitches, and bling. They have grown up with a colonial history where black and brown bodies were always hypersexualized. They are coming of age amidst a sex trade that moves bodies across the hemisphere, uploads them to watch on your video phone. For these reasons, sexuality and sexiness seem powerful to these youth, but the on-screen fantasies don't reveal girls' a special vulnerability to coerced sex, violence, and HIV. The Caribbean has one of the highest infection rates in the world, with, the fastest, with one of the fastest growing groups being girls 14 to 24 years old. In the long struggle, the time for change is always now. Feminism is the awareness of the subordination of women within society and the conscious action to change and transform this situation. Think of Haiti, with pregnant women giving birth on the street, fearing rape in camps, caring for infants, particularly at risk, and cooking what they can find because they are responsible for feeding their families. Their oppression is also the basis of an economic system fundamentally exploitative of all people. How will this nation rebuild? 
on US $3 a day in non-unionized sweatshop factories in the notorious garment industry. Beneath the shimmering surface of easy stereotypes of a happy, carefree region and beneath state marketing, corporate stocks and capitalist advertisements remain inequalities, violence and poverty, not only differently experienced by women and men, but grounded in prevailing ideas of masculinity and femininity. Not all of these need to change, but some must. Thus, for me, there is no revolution without feminism. What is this revolution? Why should a revolution be a way of life? How should it be a way of life? There are revolutions that seek to overthrow monarchies and governments, economic systems and class inequalities. I mean revolution as a struggle to transform the culture and structure of power relations within a society and across the world. I mean struggle for change, not only in our lives as individuals, but in institutions such as the family, media, schooling, and the economy. I mean change to beliefs and values that make this world unfair for women and men wherever they are. I mean change. When people ask if patriarchy can ever really be ended, I point them to Caribbean history. Almost every one of the women and men who arrived in this island after it became a European colony came as workers, Indians, Africans, Chinese, Portuguese. Women in the Caribbean have almost always worked. The majority came as laborers, not as wives, as women and as workers. They have always struggled against sexism, racism, and the violence of empire. Even when they came as free persons, all of our ancestors traveled dark waters, traveled black waters on dark ships as part of the human cargo of slavery, indentureship, and colonialism. And they ended them here. This is a region of revolutions. The Haitian, Bolivarian, Mexican, Cuban, Nicaraguan, Grenadian, Rastafari, Black Power. From this legacy, we can assure the world that change is always possible. It's 1730. Think of Nanny of the Maroons of Jamaica, spiritual, cultural, and military leader. It's 1802. Think of Henriette Saint Marc, leader in the Haitian battle for independence, executed by the French two years before they were finally defeated. It's 1881. Think of the Jamets, the wrong kind of women, coming down with sticks, drums, songs, and dances to tell the colonial governor, you cannot stop our carnival. It's 1930s. Think of Elma Francois, found of the Negro Welfare Culture and Social Association, a radical Marxist working people's organization. She was the first woman to be tried for sedition in the colony. She defended herself and was found not guilty. It's 1953. Think of Haiti Santa Maria, one of only two women who fought in the July 26 attack on the Moncada garrison in Santiago de Cuba, the battle that marked the beginning of the Cuban Revolution. Think of the Indian women who chose their own partners, sought education for their daughters, refused to cook when vexed, saved to buy their own house so they couldn't be put out, started something that ended with the first Indian woman ever to be opposition leader in a Caribbean parliament. The last 40 years alone shows radical transformation in gender relations. This is a region woven with feminist revolution. You're afraid, do afraid. Revolutionary women were participants and leaders in every riot and resistance, including their own, who didn't publicly organize, renegotiated privately, individually, quietly, and generationally. This is why a revolution is a way of life. This is why I came to feminism, to think of all those men and women who fought for the rights I could now take for granted. Ordinary, busy, working people put sweat and tears when no other movement was fighting for me. Not just me, against a whole structure upheld by laws, economics, politics, religious codes, and cultural myths. How could I forget those who lit this path? How could we forget the solidarities of men? Toussaint Louverture, Jim Barrett, Fidel Castro, Mulvi Amir, Amir Ali, Maurice Bishop, and other stick fighters in and out of the Gael. Our struggles together continue today. The long history of Caribbean feminism shows us that there are many strategies for transforming gender ideals and relations. Central to them is to strike at the battle 
of the sexes and at, at its foundations. There are simple ways to do this. In a masculinity workshop for a 2002 project called the It Takes Two Revolutionary School, all the men and women had to take on famous men's names. They then had to refer to each other by this name for the whole workshop. Jesus, Stalin, Rambo, Michael Jackson, and the Ayatollah Khomeini were all in the house. Not only did we use the names to talk about how some masculinities are valued over others and why, we also prevented men from identifying women as lesser or opposite to them in the workshop, especially if the guy ended up being named Prince and the young woman became Genghis Khan, that formidable and ruthless military genius. In workshops on femininity, all the men and women had to take on the names of famous women. You could imagine the drama. Since 2006, I've been using activism in my classes here at the University of the West Indies to do consciousness raising, strategy sharing, and solidarity building. Male and female students in the course are asked to raise awareness about women's issues. They choose topics such as sexual harassment, domestic violence, music lyrics, body image, pornography, rape, abortion, contraception, inter-ethnic relationships, and even natural hair. They then have to dialogue, debate, listen, and defend their ideas to others on the campus. Male and female students, both in and outside of the course, end up more greatly appreciating the difficult and sustained work that is needed to achieve the thorough, long-term, and global changes that they benefit from and often continue to seek. They gain an insider view of the hostilities directed at feminists and feminisms, or just against women and men speaking out on behalf of women and gender justice. They more greatly recognize the need for men to be part of challenging patriarchy's negative impacts on both women and men. The actions make women's and men's gender consciousness and mobilization a defining feature of third wave feminism. The effects are widespread. Students I never taught talk to me about changing their notions of manhood and womanhood, changing their relationships, becoming open to feminism, refusing to have cheerleaders for student sports, stopping their consumption of pornography, stepping back from violent homophobia, becoming more passionate about thorough change, not for the few or for one sex or for or but for all. Joshua, the young man who first asked me to write this essay, is one of those young men. He sat in one of my classes once, vociferously debated with my students at their popular actions, and through asking me to write this paper and to begin to, to speak about Caribbean feminism to others like him, began to be actively involved in feminist movement building. When a revolution is a way of life, feminist movement building is what you do in your every day to secure better lives for women, transformed masculinities for men, secure jobs for both, freedom from violence of all kinds, agreement on basic human rights, and a path from anger to action, whether it involves just changing how you look at the world, how you love, who you remember not to forget, who you gather as your warriors, or how you define your war. You can raise consciousness in the middle of a pasa pasa. You can build solidarity offering a five minute lift to a stranger. You can share strategies with your family as they negotiate their own personal and political lives. You can inspire your friends to support activism halfway across the world. You can claim your rights. You can simply end the myths that we walk around with in our mind. Men have never just been hunters and women gatherers. Women have been workers and leaders for millennia. Women and men are more alike than different. After all, each of us is human. Fathers can be feminists. Isms can be fought without putting women second because women are fighting the isms of racism, sexism, capitalism, militarism, and religious fundamentalism too. You can build a movement if that's what you want to do. Nothing at all is stopping you. Change is always possible. For all of us, the question is always what we want to win and for and with whom. You wonder why I say I'm feminist and what it really means. 
Don't I get fed up all the time of having to defend my dreams? I dream to change the world. Defend dreams with me. Thank you.